Okay, so welcome to the practical class today. I will start screen sharing and uh, we have actually two exercise sheets for today. I will show them. So the number three about P and then P, it was handed out the previous class, but we didn't even start solving it. But it was a so home say work. It was the first one, and uh, the second one is, uh, which is the new one. It will be devoted to graphs. So I will show it here. But again, if we have time today, we'll start discuss something from this today. If not, then we'll just postpone it to the next class as you hope to. Okay, so for the previous one, I will put the link also in the chat of the, um, the conversation of the thing. And uh, for those of you who are in class, if you need physical copy, please take it. If you already have them. Okay, so um, let's start. Let's start with problem number one, which uh, says that for any problem in the NP class, the problem is decidable in exponential time. Okay, so problem number one, if A is in and P, then A is decidable in exponential time on a deterministic machine. How do we prove it? How do we show it? How do you think? Because before this exercise, we didn't even know that NP problems are decidable. So we knew that they are decidable on non-deterministic machines, but not on deterministic machines. So in, in short, it's written like that, NP so P is a subset of NP and NP is a subset of exponential time. Well, these are more of the exercises for understanding what's happening in the course. So, uh, okay, you have a problem for which you, what is NP? So, uh, problem A, so it's A of X is yes, if and only if there exists a Y such that the length of Y is bounded by a polynomial of the length of X and uh, R of XY equals one where R is a polynomial solvable relation. How can you solve the problem A for X? How do, can you find out whether there exists such a Y? So you need to make this algorithm deterministic, make it independent from Y. How do you do it? Sorry, maybe uh, like some thoughts about the previous, not the previous, the main uh, task. Maybe uh, like uh, we can make any NP problem, like uh, we can make a CNF. So we can choose like to take note or not to take. So, and we have some like uh, subsets and count of subsets. To power n. Yes, yes. So this is a good solution, by the way. 
So what is uh, uh, suggested now is as follows. We already know by Cook Levin that if A is an NP, then A is car producible to say three set, right? We did it today as a lecture, right? And three set belongs to exponential time. Why? Because there is, for example, resolution. So we know that resolution is not always polynomial. We had this exercise, and uh, we know that uh, sometimes resolution is uh, exponential in its um, runtime, but it's no more than exponential because the saturation procedure should generate all possible all clauses which can be generated by uh, applying resolution rule, but the number of clauses is exponentially bounded. So in exponential time, resolution procedure will stop. And this will solve three set for us, or CNF set for any set, CNF. But now you have this reduction, and how do you solve A? Okay, you take X, you transform it into f of x, which is phi, which is a 3 CNF, and you have for phi you apply this algorithm, which resolution method. This is a way of solving any NP problem in exponential time, but here you will have Cook Levin and you will have Satin transformations. Of course, you can do the same easier because, well, if you are talking about satisfiability for Boolean formula, or for example, for conjunctive normal forms, uh, then uh, you, uh, what, do, what do you really do? You say that uh, uh, you can apply a resolution, but the resolution could be exponential. But if you're allowed to do exponential, uh, you don't need resolution. How can you exponential, in exponential time, how can you check for satisfiability of a Boolean formula? Just brute force, right, over all Boolean assignments. So, but actually, for the original problem A, you can also do brute force by brute forcing these witnesses Y. So, uh, for satisfiability, the witness is a satisfying assignment. For an arbitrary NP problem, the witness is this NP witness. So, for example, I want to solve three colorability of a graph in exponential time. How do I do this? Again, I say, okay, I uh, just brute force over all possible colorings and find whether there exists. So actually, the answer to problem one in one word is brute force. Just try first possible hint, second possible hint, third possible hint, etc. Okay, problem number two. Again, these are questions for, for you to understand what's happening. So. A is NP hard. A belongs to P. Then P equals NP. Why is this true? Okay, yep. So A is NP hard. This means that for any B from NP, B is M reducible to A, uh, and with A belongs to P, this means that B also belongs to P, and this for all A, this means that P is equal to A. Okay, this is problem number two. Now problem number three. So P is not equal to NP. It is a presupposition. Yeah. So could there exist a polynomial time algorithm such as the formula phi is translated in polynomial time to phi prime, which is a DNF? So you know translations into DNF, they are usually exponential. It could be possible to make it polynomial. 
if P is not equal to NP. Okay, suppose the contrary. Suppose that this is possible. That for any formula, you can polynomially construct a DNA, equivalent DNA. So there, P phi prime should be equivalent to phi, of course. What would, what, what would this mean? Oh, well, this is, yeah, this is true because we can negate it and then construct a CNF. But this will not help you. The DNF is better. What does it mean that you can equ equivalently, so this phi prime is a polynomial function of phi. And if a formula is uh, equivalent to the formula, it's equisatisfiable, right? So this means that this function will give you a polynomial reduction of sat to DNF sat. And DNF sat belongs to what complexity class? No, DNF sat. Disjunctive normal form. Checking satisfiability for disjunctive normal form is polynomial, right? We did, we did it in today's lecture. So this is in P, but this would mean that sat is in P, and this would mean that P equals NP. So if there is a possibility of polynomial transformation of formulae to DNF, then uh, this would uh, yield p equals np, right? Okay. So now uh, number four. Now we'll just exercise this. It's just for you to better understand this. So what is co np? So the co np is a class of problems A such that negation of A belongs to np. So negation of A, so negation of if A of X equals zero, then negation of A of X equals one. If A of X equals one, then uh, negation A of X equals zero. So it's flipping the result. You first uh, start with a uh, problem, then you flip the result. So for example, satisfiability belongs to NP, and tautologicity belongs to co-NP. Well, because what, how do you check whether the formula is tautology? Checking that it is a tautology means that its negation is not satisfiable, right? So phi is a tautology, if and only if, not phi is not satisfiable. And this not is this negation. It's classical co and P. And now the question of number four is that if NP is not equal to co and P, then P is not equal to NP. By the way, while you are thinking, I will also say something about tautologicity. So if you have satisfiability, then if a formula is satisfiable, it can be witnessed by an, an easy way, yep? So by just showing a concrete satisfying assignment, correct? But if your formula is uh, not satisfiable, uh, then uh, witnessing this fact is hard. How can a witness that the formula is not satisfied? We have to do a resolution, it's a long procedure. For tautologicity, it's dual. So if you have a tautology, then it's hard to witness this fact. You can either try all the possible assignments, which is exponential, or you can try some sort of reasoning, for example, to prove this formula in a calculus for classical logic. Again, this proof could be large. And it's... For tautologicity, the easy thing is to falsify it. 
So when the formula is not a tautology, it's easy to falsify it. It's easy to find just one assignment which makes it false. And this way it's cohen p. And actually, of course, it's cohen p hard. And cohen p complete in the same sense that satisfiability is np complete. Just it's, it is the same. It's uh, you just uh, can develop the theory of reductions also there and develop the theory of np cohen p hard cohen p complete problem. As any NP problem reduces to set, any co NP problem reduces to co set to tautologies. Okay, now this again, the easiest way to solve it is by contraposition. So I will show that if P equals NP, then uh, NP equals co NP. And this is quite easy to solve, right? So here, what do you have? So we want to show this, and P is the same as P. And what about co and P? Co and P is would be co P, right? And co P is the same as P. Because what is co P? Co P is the class of problems for which there is a polynomial algorithm which says yes if it is no and no if it is yes. But having this polynomial algorithm, you can just flip it in the end and have the polynomial algorithm. So far. For NP, it's not the case. We discussed it at one of the lectures that for NP, there is no way to do like this. It's uh, uh, you cannot do this flipping because the flip would flip angelic and demonic choice. So for uh, NP, you have angelic choice. If at least one path is okay, then you are you are right. And for co and P, you have a demonic choice. So how do you uh, test your, say, total logicity demonically? You say, okay, I have an deterministic algorithm, which will just guess one uh, satisfying assignment. And uh, if it's okay, then you say it's true, right? Uh, with angelic choice, this will give you satisfiability because uh, the angel will lead you through the correct path and uh, uh, give you satisfying assignment. If you're in the mnemonic choice situation, then if at least one assignment is bad, the demon will falsify. And therefore, if even in the mnemonic situation you win, this means that the demon cannot do anything with, against you. It means that the formula is false. The co and p. Okay, so now um, I think five it would be solved it just today's lecture, right? Just take a look at that. Sorry, uh, may you return the fourth one? So we have contradictions that uh, we say that, uh, okay, let's P is equal to NP, then we have, we need to show that NP is equal to coin P uh, and NP is equal to P, coin P is equal to, to co P and there is equal. Yeah, P and co P are the same because you see what is co? Co P, the Co P, let's write it here. It is the set A such that not A belongs to P, right? What does it mean? It means it means that there is a polynomial algorithm which, so the algorithm yields one if A of X is zero and zero if a of x is 1, right? Yes. And then we amend this algorithm and we just add the inversion of the result at the end. And this is a polynomial algorithm for a. So this is the same. This is equivalent to a b in p. It's the same. So this is just p. Right? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Understandable? OK. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Problem number five, it's, we did it at today's lecture, exactly, and I will not go forward. If you have questions, please ask them now, but probably it's, it's uh, quite easy. And let's go to problem number six. So six is polynomial delay. Okay, we have point A and point B, so it's yield all Assignments, satisfying assignments for a 2CNF. Why 
Okay. Does there exist a polynomial time algorithm which yields all the satisfying assignments for a given two CNF? The question is whether there is an algorithm which yields all satisfying assignments in polynomial time. No, it, it, this didn't give you all the satisfying assignments. It gave you only one. So here the answer is no. And the answer is no because suppose you have this trivial 2CNF, which says something like, I don't know, P or P1 or Q1. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make it non trivial. And P2 or Q2. So 2 CNF is not trivial, but how many satisfying assignments does it have? 2 power n. Uh, well, not 2 power n, but 3 power n. Because for each pi qi, you can have either 1, 0, 0, 1, or 1, 1. Zero, zero is impossible because the disjunction should be true. So that means three and you have n ones and they're independent. So you have three power n satisfying assignment. And now this trivial question, can you yield this number of assignments in polynomial time? Of course not, because the answer is just too large. And the, the, therefore it's just, well, you, you, you cannot do it. So the, this is why the answer to point, point A here, point A, the answer is no. And the other is point B. So 2CNF, so it's 6B. And this is 2CNF. And the question is yield. Uh, all uh, satisfying. Assignments with polynomial delay. So what it means that you start your process. So this is the timeline of your program. So it works for some polynomial time. Then at this point it should yield one assignment. Let's call it alpha one. Then again it should work some polynomial time and it should yield another assignment which we will call alpha two. So, 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 at the end, it's at some point, it yields alpha, well, big N, which is the number of assignments. This big N could be exponential, so okay. And then it, it works, again, polynomial time, and here it says stop. Stop means that there are no more assignments. And so the answer is here. So this is the total set of all assignments. So the, this uh, alpha 1, alpha n are all, so the, this set, this is the set of all satisfying assignments for our formula phi, which is the input data. Okay. So uh, you see that what is the what is going on here? We, okay, this is the best which we can take from this problem. So uh, the total working time is exponential, possibly. So it's the number of assignments multiplied by a polynomial. But each next assignment is obtained in polynomial time. And the, we can say that they should not duplicate, of course, because otherwise it's cheating. You could, so all they are AI, so if I is not J, then alpha I is not alpha J. This is important because otherwise the, the algorithm could say, 
give us the same assignment several times and save to, uh, but actually compute something else and save time for his non polynomial algorithm for doing that. So, it's, um, so phi here is a 2CNF. Okay. And the question is uh, can you construct such an algorithm? With polynomial delay. That requires a quantifying set of solutions to somehow exclude it. Yes, in a sense, yes. Yeah. So there are two possible ways of approaching that. The first way is to use our resolution method and optimize it somehow, ad ad adapt to this sort of problem. The other way is to use the solvability for 2CNF as a black box and just try to, to solve it uh, using. So we can, what we know is that 2SAT, so 2CNF SAT, it belongs to P. So the decision problem. So this is decision problem. Actually, this is the only thing we need. We can use it and uh, obtain the needed solution. Uh, maybe we need to like take one solution and then uh, like uh, add something to two CNF that uh, like uh, don't have as, as that our previous solution isn't uh, will be the solution of new to satisfiability. Yes, uh, yes, the idea. So we start with uh, so let's see it in the such sort of process. So we have five. We try to uh, satisfy it. If the answer is no, then stop. Okay. Now what happens if the answer is yes? If the answer is yes, then we try uh, phi where the first variable is zero. And then we again try to set. Again, if the answer is no, then we go backwards and try pi 1 equals 1. If the answer is yes, then we try pi 1 and pi 2 equals 0, and so on. So it's the same dichotomy. The idea is that you have this, uh, so you have this phi, and then you branch for pi 1, and here you will branch for pi 2, and so on. And finally, here you will get the assignments, right? But if you do this uh, as a brute force, you will not get a good uh, polynomial delay algorithm, right? Because, for example, possibly suppose that this one here is not satisfiable, and we know this, right? Then here in this part, there are no satisfying assignments. But at each point of this tree, we check satisfiability. So this means that if this is not satisfiable, all this subtree will just get cut off. We don't, don't try it. Then, for example, here we have a satisfiable. Then we check this. Suppose it's again satisfiable. We check this. Suppose it's not satisfiable. Again, everything below gets cut off. Then this should be satisfiable. And at some point, we obtain this satisfying alpha one. 
Then we return back by recursion and again, again, again. And this, for suppose this is satisfiable, etc. And this will give you all these alphas. And the delay will be polynomial, right? Because um, mm, how can you understand that? Uh, if the delay was not polynomial, then between two such assignments, there will be an exponential gap. The exponential gap should include such a subtree of the tree. So, okay. You could also do it by your resolution system, which you was in your home task. How did you do your resolution system? In resolution, what what, what we did? We uh, first saturated, right? So we had phi. Phi is a two CNF, so you can take phi. Then you saturate it by resolution. You get phi one. And you already know the isolated literals. But suppose there is P, which is not no P, no, not P isolated. So in this case, what, what we did, we said, OK, let P be zero. And this is going to be phi. One prime, and then you do proceed by induction, right? And P, Q is that, right? But here you can also say that P could be equal to one, and you will get another version of phi, and you will get other satisfying assignments, right? So in the solution which was in your homework, you just took one of them in order to obtain the satisfying assignment, right? But here you should try both ways, and both of them, they both will be fruitful. Because this is satisfiable, and this is also satisfiable. This is independent of phi. And this means that after you, so here you did this, but then you, it's a recursive call, but you will return to this again, you do the saturation for p equals 1. And this will give you all satisfying assignment, and the delays will be always polynomial. Because again, at each branch of your algorithm, you will have at least one satisfying assignment. So no, no long waiting. OK? Is it clear how to solve 6b? Yes. OK, great. So now let's try 7, and we'll, we are done with this session. Or you want to take 7 for, uh, for another week. It's just you, up to you. I will formulate it on the screen also while you are thinking. So 7. So if, suppose, P is not equal to NP. And we are talking about the following uh, decision problem, that the number of alpha such that alpha is satisfying assignment for phi, this number is greater or equal than 2. So sat is, uh, if, if there were one instead of two, this will be sat, right? But there's two. So if there are at least two satisfied assignments for, for this. No, the, uh, the sat itself, so sat is uh, NP hard. So uh, suppose that this, then sat is not NP, right? If, 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 P, if P not equal to NP. Well, it's not, no, well, you have to show that this is harder than set. Okay, let's call this problem, this problem will be called, I don't know, set prime. Or set, set prime, okay. So, in order to show that set prime is harder than set, you need to reduce, right? Because, why is, it? oh, this is a trick which you should also understand, that, uh, if you have a problem A, 
And then you have another problem B. And the problem B, say, has less solutions than problem A. This is not a reduction. So uh, if you have, OK, uh, satisfying set is, in a sense, easier than satisfying set prime, when you can think so. Because satisfying set prime, you have to, to obtain two possible satisfying assignments, which should be different. And for satisfying set, you need only one. But this does not mean that set prime is easier than set. Uh, because uh, it's just less, the less, less x is on which it's going to be true, but let's consider the extreme case where the, there is a problem which is always false. So let's put here 2 n plus 1, 2 power n plus 1. This is never solvable, right? Because there could, could not be 2 power n plus 1 solutions. But this problem is trivial in P because your polynomial algorithm just says no, it's always no. So here, the, this is not the case that it is. So you need to show it accurately that this set, that set is uh, easier than set prime. And this is, so you just have to provide a proper reduction here, as we defined it. Not just say that uh, if a formula is satisfiable in the sense of set, that this formula satisfies in the sense of set prime, but the reduction should be in the backwards direction also. So for a formula phi, your reduction uh, should obtain a formula phi prime such that phi is satisfiable if and only if phi prime is this modifiedly satisfiable. If you manage to do this, yes, you will uh, obtain the solution for problem seven. How can you obtain such a reduction? Yes. Yes, and this literal is added by disjunction, right? Because otherwise you will have time. So yeah, this is a good solution. So you will have phi prime, which is just phi or q, where q is not a variable of phi. It's a new one, yeah? Or, or it's not the case. Uh, yes. So uh, suppose... So if phi is satisfiable, then uh, phi prime has at least two satisfying assignments. So either q equals 0 and phi equals 1. So this is satisfying for phi, right? And the other is just q equals 0 and phi arbitrary. Oh, Q equals one, sorry. But but this is a problem because the backwards direction will not work. Because this formula has many assignments. If you make Q one, then it's bad, right? And you need to so this is not a good solution. We need to augment it a bit. And let's try it like this. So uh, we uh, make phi prime we make phi prime which is um, probably we could make it actually easier. We can make it phi and q or not q. So you see that alpha is satisfying for phi prime if and only if for phi. If and only if alpha and q equals zero 
and alpha and q equals 1 are both satisfying for phi prime, right? Because q is, we just add another variable, which is not so, again, q is not a variable of phi, And any satisfying assignment of the original formula generates two satisfying, exactly two satisfying assignments for the new formula, right? Because phi should be satisfied, it's conjunction. And then you just say that it's q, maybe a one, and maybe zero. And so if the original formula is satisfiable, then this formula has two or more satisfying assignments. If the original formula is not satisfiable, then this formula has no satisfying assignments. In particular, it's not less than greater than two. So this is the reduction. The reduction says that we reduce sat to set prime. We know that if p is not equal to np, that set prime is not in p. Therefore, set is not in polynomial. Therefore, set prime is also not polynomial. If it were polynomial, then by reduction we will get polynomiality of set, which is not the case if p is not equal to n p. Okay, great. We finished this problem sheet. If any questions, please ask. If not, I will show you the um, second one. So it's about graphs. It's all published on web. Practice problem number four. So Again, you see it on the screen. I will dis distribute, I will take one for myself. And uh, this is the new exercise, it's six exercises. Okay, and, and here, well, there are some problems which are not algorithmic ones, which are just uh, about um, graphs. And the, in the end, you will have reducibility. So in reducibility, in problem five, so it's it's also here. Yeah. Uh, I think please do not use Kuklevin. It will be sort of you, all the reduction should be made directly. So again, we have half an hour, roughly half an hour left. Uh, let's do our usual trick. Let's from some of the uh, exercises, let's do point A, and everything else will go for home. Okay, let's do 1a. So it's graphs. One A. So there is so uh, number of vertices, and here is going to be degree. So there are nine vertices of degree three. 11 vertices of degree 4 and 10 vertices of degree 5. It's a whole number of vertices in our graph. And there is a hint, by the way. If yes, how many edges should this graph have? Yeah, so the sum for all v in the vertices, the degrees of v. So the degree of a vertex is the number of edges which comes here. So see here is say four, degree four. Should be two multiplied by the number of edges. Well, why two? Because each edge has two, so it's v1 and v2, and it was counted twice in the degree of v1 and in the degree of v2, right? And now in 1a, what is the sum of the degrees? Well, here the sum is 9 multiplied by 3 plus 11 multiplied by 4, plus 10 multiplied by 5. Could it be 2 multiplied by the number of edges? No, because it's odd. So this is odd. The, these two are even. So this is odd. And therefore, it could not be 2 multiplied by the number of edges. This is called the handshake lemma. And it shows that. It's... So 1b and 1c are for your sake. 
how, how thinking. Okay, clear? Understandable, right? No, nothing specific. So now the uh, point to A, I will start with the story. So I will write this name Euler. Mm. Um, Euler lived in the city of Königsberg, which is now called Kaliningrad, the Baltics. And uh, there was this well-known problem of uh, Königsberg bridges. So the center of this of the town, or uh, there is a river which flows into Baltic Sea. The river is called Pregel or Pregola. There are two islands, one and two, and they are connected with bridges to the banks and to themselves. So here is one bank, one br two bridges here, two bridges here, one bridge here, one bridge here, and one bridge connecting the islands. So, Ola asked for the following question. Whether you can traverse the city center of the city of Königsberg, as it was called at that time, um, so that you visit each bridge exactly once. So if you wanted to roam along the bridges, and uh, the, this uh, way of traversing such a map was called the Euler path. And uh, in order to make it more graph theoretic, you can denote the areas by, say, letters. And these are going to be our vertices. So this is our vertex A. Here is vertex C. Here is vertex D. Here is vertex B. And there is this connection. So this is what, what we call the multigraph, because uh, here we have parallel edges, parallel bridges. They have parallel edges. It's okay, um, like this and like this. So uh, Ola asked this question, and the answer is, of course, no. Why? Well, suppose we start somewhere at some point, then we start traversing, and suppose say C is not our starting point. We didn't start from C. Then uh, we had to enter it, then exit somehow. Enter, then exit, and there will be one extra bridge we did, which we didn't traverse. And there... Uh, Main thing here is that any inner vertex of an Euler path should have even degree. Because we have to traverse all the possible uh, edges which come into this uh, vertex. And since we didn't start there, we didn't finish there, there should be pairs of entry and exit. They're all distinct edges. So if it is odd, then one edge will be not covered. The starting and the ending point, they could be odd. And they will be odd if they are different. So if it's the same, then when we start and finish at the same point, then all the vertices are even. And this path is called an Euler cycle. So um, this was how uh, this uh, uh, problem is solved. And uh, we can now return to, to A, which is a bit different, because here is a concrete graph with this, these degrees. So it's a multigraph with three vertices of degree 3. This is A, D, and B, and one vertex of degree 5. This is a concrete example of such a graph, but actually 
we did not use that it is a concrete example. Well, what was the problem? That there were four vertices of even, of sorry, four vertices of odd degree, and there are only two possible vertices of odd degree if another path exists, right? Because the starting and the ending point are allowed to have odd degree. But the inner points should have even degree. Here it's impossible, and therefore point, uh, problem 2a, the answer is no, independently of the concrete realization of this graph. You can, by the way, think, do there exist other graphs which obey 2a, which are not isomorphic to this one? So, uh, and all the story of his problem ended in a funny uh, manner. Um, that uh, this problem, well, he understood it was a funny mathematical say, uh, question. And uh, he asked various people to try to solve it. Not many people could do this. And uh, this, at some point, this problem was presented to German emperor. Who said, OK, I have a solution. It's possible. And the solution was the following. Build one more bridge in Kennexberg. The funny thing that the bridge was, the bridge was really built. It's called Kaiser Brücke, uh, Emperor Bridge. Um, by the way, I always ask this. I've never been to this town, unfortunately. I always ask people uh, whether today the answer is yes or no. Because, uh, well, long time passed and some of the bridges were built, of course, new ones. Most of them were just crossing the river without taking this island, because this is a map of the very city center. It's not of the whole town. The whole town is much larger now. Some of the bridges in, in, in the city center were demolished. So it means that the map changed, and you can look at the say, Google map of Königsberg and of Kaliningrad now, and uh, find out whether now it is an oil or graph or not. Okay, so point to be, as usual, we'll leave it for your home task. And now problem three. How do you decide whether a graph has an Euler path? In polynomial time, how do you do this? What could an algorithm be here? Well, we just, I guess that we just need to visit every vertex. And what? And uh, to see whether the degree of a vertex is odd or not. And if uh, there are um, vertexes that uh, have, that um, whose degree is not odd, uh, sorry, I forgot. <clears throat> mm, sorry. Uh, uh, and if there are mm, vertexes whose degree is odd, we need to calculate how many of them. If there are two vertexes with odd degree and others uh, uh, and other vertexes have uh, not odd degree, then Euler path exists. Okay, so you want to refer to the following. Well, we can call it theorem, right? So an Euler path exists if and only if the number of uh, vertices such that the degree of vertex is odd. This number should be, I don't know, less or equal than two. Well, it could not be uh, one, so it's either zero or, or two, right? It could not be one by handshake theorem. Is this a true theorem? How do you think? Well, from left to right, obviously, right? If there is another path, that there could be only two, maximum two vertices with. But it is true on the back one. Well, um,
Yeah, so this graph, all, all vertices are even, but there's no other path. Right. Well, uh, okay, then there must be an, um, one more condition that this graph should be connected. Yes, and the graph is connected. Okay, so this theorem is, uh, this is true, but it's not obvious because how from this you can uh, show that, uh, you have this condition on the graph, how do you show that uh, the Euler cycle really exists, Euler, sorry, Euler path really exists? It's how to construct it. And since we have not so much time, we'll do take it to home. So it's say another part. So the first uh, thing here is to prove this theorem. Okay. And the second question connected to problem number three is to give a polynomial algorithm which uh, yields one all the path in a given graph. So uh, the algorithm should not only say whether the path exists, but also yield one. Yeah, if it exists. Otherwise, it says no. So it can check this condition, of course. But then the problem is to yield at least one such a path. And this is not, not, not a trivial thing because checking this, well, how to check this condition in polynomial time? Well, it's easy. First, you just take each vertex and check its uh, degree. You're allowed to have only two, maximum two out vertices. This is easy. Also, you have to check connectedness. Well, checking connectedness, well, there is an algorithm, standard algorithm for doing this. It's sort of like uh, depth first search in the graph. You just take a vertex. And then you recursively list all the vertices which are uh, accessible from it. And this should coincide with the whole set of vertices, right? So checking for connectedness is also quite easy. Polynomial is solvable. But then uh, checking this does not give you the really the Euler path. Because, well, just check some condition. And actually, these two are connected. Because if you prove the theorem, it's the, proof, you, the usual proof is constructive. This will give you an algorithm for finding it. Okay, let's postpone this. And also, let's postpone problem number four. It's about a Hamiltonian cycle. It's different from the Euler cycle because here you visit each vertex exactly once. And here you just have this funny picture where you can find the uh, Hamiltonian cycle. Or maybe prove that it does not exist. Okay, and now we uh, do five, let's do five A. So uh, let's show that. So five A, you have the independent set problem. Or you can, no, you can do it like this. So let's, let's, in the, let's do five A, but the second part of it. They are symmetric, but nevertheless. We want to show that the problem of click is reducible to problem of independent set. So an independent set, as we learned from today's lecture, is a set of vertices in a graph which are no, not connected pairwisely, right? A click is dual. So the click is a um, subset of the vertices such as all of them are connected. So for example, here is some graph. I could draw some isolated, not connected things like some isolated vertex, for example, something here. And here you see that this is a click of three vertices, mutually connected. And for example, somewhere here I could write 
connect something like that. So this is a click of four. Right? So click is something which is... So again, how the click problem is formulated. So click is formulated as follows. So given a graph and number k, answer whether g includes a click of uh, k vertices. So click is a decision problem. Click is trivial in the class of NP, right? And actually this, well, well it is in NP because the click is, you can just not deterministically get the click. It's an NP witness, right? Okay. And this actually solves this question. Why? Even without any further consideration. In set is not only in NP, it's also in NP complete. Today's lecture will prove that a click is NP, in set is NP complete, therefore click is reducible to in set. How can you reduce it? Well, you reduce click to set, then set by Kuklevin, then set to three set by Satan, and then three set to in set by NP. Oh, the proof of uh, its NP hardness. And this makes it true. But of course, the, here we, need, we wanted to uh, solve it accurately. Give a, no, no, accurately. Concrete, give a concrete reduction without referring to Kuklevin. How can you reduce it? So this is click and in set is does it include a, an independent set of K vertices? So we need to show that you have graph gk and you want to obtain some g prime k prime which is going to be the red, red, reduct of gk such that g prime k prime has a, an independent set of k vertices if and only if of k prime vertices, so g, let's see, g prime. If and only if g has a click of k vertices. How do you perform this reduction? Possibly, yes. And G prime and G U also should be different. Suppose we don't have a click, so it means that uh, all of the suppose okay, so, so if we don't have an independent set, it means that each vertex, uh, uh, how to say, has some connections. Uh, with, uh, no, but it's also number K. The problem is that it depends on the number k. Oh, but how can you transform a click into an independent set? Yes, so if we just... So, do what they call graph complement. So let me write this down. So this is graph G bar is the complement graph of G. How is it constructed? Okay, suppose we have the, say for example, this is graph and we'll try to find something. Okay, five vertices, for example. And we'll try, for example, to do, okay, let's six vertices. And we'll do it like this. This is a graph, right? And the complement, so this is G. The complement is that we connect everything which was not connected. So G prime is G bar. 
and uh, we connect everything which was not connected. Right? And OK, now, for example, if k equals 3, then here we have an independent set of three elements. And here we have a click of the same three vertices. So k prime will be just k. So the function f should uh, take an pair gk. It should transform it into the dual G and the same K, the complement graph and the same K. So, um, then if there is a, an independent set of size K in the original graph G, then the same set of vertices will form a click in the complement graph. So uh, this means that this function, if we know how to find independent sets, so yeah, I know it's sorry, it's it's dual. Yep. So let's let's call this graph G, and we have a click in it, and this is G, which is G prime, and the direction is here. So this is K prime, and this is K. Okay, so we had a click. We want to reduce click to independent set. A click in the original graph exactly corresponds to a, an independent set in the complement graph, right? So if there's red, it's click, and this green is independent set. I know, vice versa. So this reduction reduces click to independent set of the same size. Also, the same reduction reduces independent set to click. Therefore, this is in point A, they're both. Yeah, but uh, this is this is input data. So our algorithm takes the input data, which is of two objects: it's a graph and a natural number. So uh, the, if we, we want to find a click, so this is GK, which is taken as an input of our algorithm. We transform it into complement G, the, the same K, and submit this as an um, argument to independent set checking algorithm. So we find in the complement graph, which is on the left, we find the independent set of size K, and then we... Uh, Understand that this in the original graph, this was a click. Okay. So, but the funny thing here is that uh, this reduction also reduces the problem is the other way around. So, if we apply this reduction to click, we obtain inset. If we apply it to inset, we obtain the problem click. This is not not the usual thing to happen, but this is a good example of two say mutually equivalent problems in NP. They're both in p-hard, both in p-complete. Because in set is in p-complete, we will also modify our, by taking the complement graph in our lecture example, we could show the click is in p-complete. They're just equivalent. And um, the second problem that in set is reducible to vertex cover, which will show that vertex cover is uh, in p-hard also in p-complete, so this is given a graph G and a number K, there is a vertex cover, that there is a set of vertices such that they cover all the edges. The definition is here, and this is for your home thinking. And now, well, there is also problem number six. So let me just, uh, sh so I will not solve it now because we have only three minutes left, but uh, problem six, I will show it also on the screen. It says that the two colorability problem is uh, can be reduced to two set. So you see that in our lectures we had the reducing of three colorability to three set, 
And this meant that um, uh, it was just a particular case of Kuk Levin theorem, right? So we reduced it to SAT and then to 3 SAT. Actually, we immediately reduced it to 3 SAT. And it said, okay, the 3 SAT is an NP hard problem. Therefore, any NP problem reduces to SAT or to 3 SAT. In particular, 3 color reduces to 3 SAT in a natural way, right? We saw it in our lectures. Here we have two colorability. So what is two colorability? You color your graph into two colors such that uh, all the any edges have different colors on the edge. So it's making a graph by apartheid, as you call it. And uh, it is a polynomial solvable question. And here the reduction reduces it to two set. And this is going to be an example of you really say usability of our reductions. Because how do you check that the graph is colorable in two colors? Well, you need to invent an algorithm, right? But you can avoid doing that by reducing it to two set, for which you already have an algorithm. So this is how reductions work inside P. The details, well, it's quite a simple task. I think you will do it in this week. So uh, this is the end of today's class. If any questions, please ask them. If not, I remind you that the next uh, Wednesday is a deadline for uh, homework one. And for probably check just the I will show it here. Um, October twelve. Yep, it's. What does it mean? Uh, um, oh, it's just it's just a copy from the previous. It means that you can actually submit it next day because uh, uh, once uh, it, there were people from the Western Hemisphere in the class, and therefore they had extra time. So it's, it's 3 p.m. Moscow time on the next day, actually. So uh, okay. uh, uh, actually not, not midnight, you can until the 3 p.m. next day. Because, well, you can submit it until at least somewhere on the earth. It's October 12. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a gift for you. It's just because, well, not to count for that. So actually, you can submit it also on Thursday before lunch. This means anywhere or not. But it is strict. So if you fail, then, uh, well, uh, if you fail to adhere the deadline, I think the system will disallow you to submit. And it's not the case I want it to happen, actually. Because there will be reductions of the grade, definitely, for submitting after the deadline. Yes, none will not be tolerated. Uh, so um, next, uh, this probably this Friday or Saturday, I will submit, I will publish the second home assignment, a written one, there will be a deadline. I will do it by also announce it on Teams and by email, so please don't worry. And that's it, and next time we meet in a week.